Hey, hey, Waffle Gang, I do hope you are well. My name is Mark, and today we're checking out some more Reddit stories. And if you do love a Reddit story, why not consider hitting that like, subscribe, maybe that notification bell too. Let's crack on with today's first story. Much love, guys. Now, before we do get into today's story, I do want to give you a warning that there is talk of a car accident and someone losing their life from the car accident as well. So if you do want to skip the story, please feel free to do so. Timestamps are always down in the description and along the timeline below. Thank you. And it's titled, Would I Be the Asshole Here? If I told my kids, male 16, female 18, their recently deceased mother cheated on me. And it's from Constant Space 3136. The wound's still a bit fresh. A month ago, my wife of 22 years tragically died in a car crash. Cynthia was one of those drivers that loved to stare into her phone and unfortunately, this bad habit caught up with her in the last week of January. I was pretty devastated when the police showed up at my door and told me she had a fatal accident and I wanted to honor her somehow. At the time of the accident, I had no idea she was having an affair. The last four or five months, I did notice she was pulling away and our intimacy decreased. But I thought this was just something that happened to couples after 20 years, so I didn't pay much mind to it. But at least from what she told me, Cynthia started to get into writing. She was constantly on her laptop, typing away at all hours. She told me she was working on a fantasy book, hopefully the first of a series. When I asked more, she said it was about a fantasy world where a super advanced human race appears and interacts with orcs and elves and magic with laser guns and high tech. It sounded very cool and Cynthia promised as soon as she had a first draft she liked, she would let me read it. I decided to honor her by getting the draft of her book and hiring a writer to clean it up and publish it with a novelty press. I got on her laptop and no book, no sign at all. I opened her Chrome, thinking she might have written it on Google Drive and saw a bunch of pinned tabs. One was a Facebook Messenger tab with a ton of messages with a man, John. I have no idea who John is. Never met him, but they talked about meeting up, exchange photos, everything. The last message John sent her was two days before Cynthia's accident. The two saying they loved each other and him saying he was going on a business trip to Germany. The messages between Cynthia and John has shown that they met up at the house more than once. So I already had the locks changed. Not sure if John is back yet and frankly don't care if he is. I was thoroughly devastated. She did have a Google Drive tab but in her drive wasn't a book about elves versus Vulcans but a shared document with John. The document was a plan her and John drafted on how to divorce me, turn the kids against me, and take our home and as much money as possible. One thing she noted was she's been taking money, a few hundred a month, and putting it in a separate account. I got the bank thing sorted out and the money in the kids' college account. I've also been going to therapy twice a week now. It is hard to be mad at someone dead, especially someone Everyone else in your life is grieving and praising as a wonderful wife and mother. I have asked my therapy if I should tell my kids about what Cynthia has done and what she was planning to do. My therapist cautioned me about this. He said that they just lost their mother and being told this would be condemning her memory. Now, I might absolutely butcher this pronunciation, so bear with me here, but damnatio memoriae. <laughs> Maybe now is not the time, but I think eventually would be time for my kids to know. And I think on this occasion, I would agree with the therapist that maybe one day that they should find out this information, but absolutely not right now, especially when they're going through a lot themselves with the grieving, etc., etc. That's already a, a ton to deal with. With that on top, you know, that could send them over the edge. There is the question of, you know, why ever tell them about this? Because what is there to gain from it? But a part of me thinks that, you know, otherwise OP's going to have to always act like she was the perfect wife when clearly she wasn't after OP found out all this information. And it might be difficult to hide those feelings. So one day the information might have to come out. I struggle for what's the best in this situation. So let's head down to the comments to see what they say. Distinct Armadillo says now is definitely not the time to burden them with that. Outrageous Guava says, I agree. As someone who lost a parent when I was growing up, I could not handle information like that at the time. I know every kid is different, so you know yours the best, but personally, I think it'd be easier to wait until they're independent adults. 
not just legal adults because I do not consider myself to be functioning as an adult at 18 and can process everything without it taking a toll on their mental health during a time of grief. I totally agree with that. I still wonder if I'm a functioning adult now. But Rex Master says, yeah, like waiting until they are steady in their careers. I read something a long time ago when one parent told the kids when one just finished high school and the other was in college, it broke them. The college student dropped out and I can't even remember what happened to the 18 year old. Maybe only tell them if they're experiencing something similar in their lives so they can see that you understand what they are going through. Honestly, there is no need to tell them. Zookeeper Keeper Game Alert says, my kids were grown and still had daddy on a pedestal. I told them eventually that he might have been a good dad, but he wasn't a good husband. They got it. They were four and five when he died and 20 something when I said that. They quit comparing their stepdad so harshly. Symbolic Shambolic replies that saying, this is literally all you need to say. That you mourn him differently because he was different with you than he was with them. My mom has told me some things about my late father recently. And it's hard to take. Plus, there's nothing to be done about it now. It just makes me feel bad that I didn't know what was going on at the time, even though I was a kid. She was the adult who chose to not take action. Aha says, I will absolutely take some things to my grave, unless my daughter finds a way to get it out of me on my deathbed. I can tell they really don't want to know all of it. No one knows all of it. They don't need to know all of it. Adults should not be telling children everything that goes on in adult relationships. Full stop. But later, it's a coin toss whether to tell children about such things. I don't think it's helpful unless for a very good reason. For example, my ex is bipolar. That's the most genetically determined of the major mental illnesses. And some of its history is relevant, although the children have now passed the point where bipolar makes its appearance, so it's a bit easier to discuss. And the comments pretty much continued along that path. Some people saying, you know, they would never tell their children that no matter what. Some people saying, you know, later in life is acceptable for this kind of information, but definitely not as children. Five days later, OP updates their post and says some things have happened since the last time. To answer some questions, I've gone to the bank and got control of Cynthia's account and transferred the money into a savings account for the kids. Also, my kids already suspected. Tuesday night, my eldest Michelle said her and my son Jason had something to say to me. They sat me down in the living room and Michelle said, we think mum was cheating on you. They both said they weren't sure, but it was eating them up seeing me in extreme grief the past month and they thought I should hear what they suspect. They brought up how Cynthia was always away, and when she was at home, she would say strange observations about me. Stuff like, isn't it weird that your dad's working late this week? This is one of those seeds Cynthia mentioned in her document that she wanted to plant in the kids. Michelle said her suspicions went high the week before the accident, when she got home from school and saw a strange jacket on a coat hook by the front door. There wasn't any jacket Jason or I had, so she was very suspicious about it. I told both my kids that I didn't tell them, but I found evidence on their mum's computer. When I was looking for the book she said she was writing. Michelle wanted to see the evidence, but Jason said he doesn't want to think or talk about mum for a while. I shared the info with Michelle. After she insisted, she already suspected her mum and was ready for it. It feels good to now have someone close that can talk with me about this beyond my therapist. Yesterday afternoon, I was home alone when I heard someone jiggling the back doorknob. I went to the door and saw a man I never saw before trying to use the key on the lock. I told him to step back from the door and he almost jumped. I opened the door a crack and asked him who he was and what he was doing in my backyard. It was John, Cynthia's affair partner. He told me that he worked with my wife and he just got back from a trip and saw Cynthia died on social media and him and Cynthia were starting a business. He had a business bank account with his investment money in the business and he was wondering if I could help him get the business funds transferred over. I looked him straight in the eye and said I was at the bank and Cynthia didn't have an extra business account and I had no idea what he was talking about. John also said that he wanted to check my wife's things for any sensitive business documents. I said he was a stranger and wasn't welcome in my home, especially since he tried to enter without permission. John looked defeated but did suggest he would consult with a lawyer about his sensitive business documents and business funds. And the top comments after that, no investigator said John had a key to your home. Carolina Mama says, and he knew Cynthia was dead and still tried to enter like he had rights to it. 
Opie needs to consult their own lawyer and get the locks changed. Catastrophe says he wanted the money and to get rid of all the proof where the money came from. Opie needs to secure all those things he found in case this guy will try to go to court with his story. Virtual Choir Boy says, honestly, you might want to start calling lawyers and get a consultation with both family law and civil litigation attorneys on the off chance John actually pursues something further. I would also start taking the time to go through everything of hers, along with changing the passwords to all her online accounts. And when changing the passwords, don't forget to change the security questions as well as any phone numbers and emails attached to the accounts. And I think all the advice is just there, you know, talking to lawyers, changing your locks, all that kind of stuff. Imagine this dude trying to unlock the back door to get in. Crazy ass behavior. But what do you guys make of this situation? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. And let's move on to another story. And our next story comes from Plastic T 2094 from the Am I the Arsehole subreddit and says, Am I the Arsehole for bringing my toddler on a group trip, even though it made my friend upset? Me, 29 male, and my wife, Angie, 27 female, have a son, Sam, turned two this week. We're part of a friend group made up of seven people, including us. There is one more couple in this group. The other three are Zoe, 32 female, Greg, 41 male, and Tim, 30 male. Phew, no marks. <laughs> Zoe doesn't like kids. She openly avoids them whenever she can. I've always known about this and have no problem with it. There have, however, been occasions in which she seemed to take it a bit too far. Her friend group lives all over the country now, and most of us only get together once or twice a year. This January, we all decided to take a five-day trip to Greg's beach house. It's in a different state and a two-hour flight away. Both Greg and Tim have children. Greg made sure to invite us over while his kid would be with his ex, but Tim is a single father and couldn't afford to leave his daughter with a babysitter for five days. Due to that, it was decided that both Tim's daughter and Sam were welcome on the trip. Angie and I offered to leave Sam with my mother-in-law, but the whole group, including Zoe, said it was fine. All of these decisions were made two months in advance. Two days prior to the trip, Tim informed us that his daughter had chicken pox and he had to cancel their tickets to stay with her. At that, Zoe called Angie and said, guess your mum will have a busy week. My mother-in-law was traveling and wouldn't be back for another week. We had no other babysitting options available or time to find one. So we told Zoe that we're still bringing Sam with us. Zoe protested, saying that she was only okay with having kids around during the trip because she knew Tim had no choice and we had no excuse to bring Sam now now that Tim's daughter wasn't coming anymore. But we held our ground. The others took our side. During the trip, Angie and I made efforts to help Zoe avoid Sam as much as possible. This ended up making our own trip underwhelming, as we're spending a lot of time apart and didn't get to see our friends as much as we wanted to. But it worked. Zoe and Sam were in the same room a total of four times, including both our arrival and departure from Greg's house. In spite of that, she insisted that we ruined her trip by bringing him and that it was selfish of us to not consider her feelings about children after Tim dropped out. Zoe hasn't spoken to us since we flew back home. This week, she unfollowed Angie on Instagram 10 minutes after she made a post for Sam's second birthday. So I think she's still bitter. Angie has been feeling guilty about this. I tried to reassure her that we had no other option and it was unreasonable of Zoe to ask us to change our plans at the last minute like that. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't consider we might be in the wrong. Am I the arsehole? Absolutely not the arsehole in this situation. And that's just some wild ass behavior from Zoe. You know, she cannot like kids. That's totally up to her. I know people that, you know, don't like being around kids, but you had no choice in this matter. And it's a weird thing for her to, you know, and she accepted all of this initially because now Tim isn't bringing his kid. She sort of gets, she gets all weird about it and says that you can't bring yours two days before the trip. And simply you didn't have enough time to find an alternative babysitter. Absolutely not the arsehole. It's just strange logic in my opinion. But euthanasia says, you know what? Sometimes you can't just change plans at the last minute. Like pulling a trusted babysitter out of your butt when you were led to believe till two days before that you wouldn't even need one at all. Sucks for Zoe that she doesn't like kids. 
I don't like kids either, OP, but you can't just stick your kid in a room at home with a litter box and an automatic feeding system. You had to bring your kid with you, as was the plan all along. Sucks for Zoe, not the arsehole OP. Edit to add, my husband had a take on this. Zoe might have been accommodating for Tim and his daughter because Zoe might have a little thing for Tim. Ooh, interesting. And since Tim dropped out, why would she want to put up with your kid cluttering up the beach house? Opie says trusted is a key word here. We have the numbers of babysitters we trust, but we never left Sam with them for more than a few hours. The only person we trust to take care of him for that long is my mother-in-law. My mom lives in a different state. Father-in-law has never spent more than four hours alone with a toddler, and my father is no longer with us. Nanny Ogsnickers says, and to be fair, a huge number of parents would feel exactly the same way. You can leave your kid with a friend for a few hours, but for days, you're definitely looking at family. The vast majority. I know some don't have healthy families and their friends are much better suited. Owls and Cardinals says, so not the arsehole. Zoe is wildly the arsehole here. It's a strange double standard for her to be understanding that Tim had no choice, but not be willing to extend the same courtesy to you when Tim's plans had to change. From what you described, you also had no choice at that point. What did she expect you to predict with your magic ball that you should have your mother-in-law on backup duty just in case Tim's plans fell through? It's so bogus. And as you said, this was all decided months ago. Zoe is strangely entitled to think that she should be able to call the shots in a group like that. If she decided on having a kid around wasn't her cup of tea, she should have skipped the trip. She seems to have some really negative and callous feelings towards you, and maybe you're better off moving on from her as a friend. Opie says to Zoe, Tim's reason of my kid is sick is better than ours, we can't find a babysitter in two days. Which seems fair, but it doesn't change the fact that we couldn't. It's not fair at all. You have a legitimate reason why you can't find childcare in this short space amount of time. And I don't care what it is, Zoe's coming up with some bullshit excuses. It feels like there's more going on with Zoe towards OP here. Or maybe that last comment said towards Tim, maybe. Ooh, cheeky. I was in Cardinal's replies to OP saying, I'm more referring to the fact that Zoe was accepting of this plan back when it, when it was Tim who didn't have a good option to leave the kid at home during the trip and the double standard applied to you. That when you also did not have a good option to leave your kid at home, Zoe freaked out. Opie says, I get what you're saying, but I think she'd react the same if the roles were reversed. Asperlev says, why is Zoe still in this friend group? I mean, what makes her so valuable that she can dictate people's lives and vacations based on a dislike for children? She sounds miserable and hateful, and I can't understand why anyone would think this is okay. Not the arsehole. So, around half a month later, Opie came in with an update and said, hey again, I went through your comments on my previous post, as well as your replies to my own comments. I managed to come to terms with the fact that Angie and I can no longer be friends with Zoe. Many of you asked why we were still friends in the first place. Most of the friend group has known each other since college, hence the different ages. I'm actually an outsider. I became friends with them through my wife. I know Zoe well, but she was definitely closer to Angie than to me. I don't think Reddit is the best place to describe an almost decade-long friendship in proper detail, but I will say Zoe was usually a nice and generous friend but she started getting more and more rude as we started having kids. She basically ignored my wife during her pregnancy and made several demeaning comments after Sam was born. Angie only forgave her because she apologized, half-heartedly if you ask me. The other couple in the friend group has been trying to conceive for a few months and she frequently jokes that they need to enjoy life while they can. She's nicer to Tim because he's a single father, but she very clearly doesn't like his daughter. So I think everyone, myself included, is much more fond of college Zoe. And it was only because of that fondness that we still hung out. The more I read your comments, the more it became clear the group has outgrown that friendship. Looking back, I feel awful about my efforts to keep Sam and Zoe apart. My son is not toxic and I shouldn't have treated him as such. If Zoe can't respect Sam and treat him like a human being, I have no obligation to put up with her. I spoke to Angie. She said that Zoe has always been a shoulder to cry on, but often also the reason she was crying in the first place. She told me it had been hard to accept that, but Zoe's behavior during the trip was the last straw. We agreed to end our friendship with her. We both text Zoe that we wished her well, but it's best we go our separate ways. She responded by calling my wife the C word 
and was blocked. We later found out she complained to the rest of the group, plus some other mutuals that would become selfish, entitled parents that let our kid ruin her vacation before cutting her off. Those who know that's not true have told us they're thinking about ending their friendships with her as well. Both Greg and Tim already have. I don't think I have anything else to add. I do my best to use this experience to become a better father, husband, and friend. My family is everything to me, and I'll never lose sight of that. Thank you all. And a couple of top comments from this one. So Twins Islander says, thank you for the update. I'm very happy for you. I think you're a great dad because you take the time to reflect on your actions and how you can improve. Parents are human beings, so not perfect. The willingness to acknowledge your limitations and errors and to learn from this in my book, What Make a Good Apart, apart from the obvious love and care, as this way you can teach your child life lessons. I wish you all the happiness in the world. Opie says thank you for this. I'm so angry at myself for keeping Sam away from her the way I did. I'm ready to use this situation to improve. And Silver Fairy says, I'm a child-free woman and I don't understand people like Zoe at all. Now, I'm a big fan of kids, you know. I, I, I love seeing them, like, just having fun, being joyful. It makes me happy. It gives me that serotonin boost, if you like. Especially my, like, nieces and nephews having a good time, laughing away. It's just absolutely amazing. But I do understand people that don't want to be around kids, don't want the, the noise levels, the, the chaos sometimes, you know, I totally get that. But it just feels like in this situation, Zoe actively hates kids and wants to push this onto everybody else. And I think sometimes you have to accept that you've outgrown relationships. And I think this is just one of those cases. But Zoe's reaction when, you know, they said that they it's best they go their separate ways and she just came up with a C word, just basically said it all for me. But what do you guys make of this situation? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Have you ever found yourself outgrowing a relationship like that with a friend? Let us know your thoughts. Now, just a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for getting involved in today's stories, your love, your support, your time, not just towards me, but towards the OPs, towards the stories, towards one another down in the comments as well. I always see you guys supporting one another and I think it's absolutely amazing, you know, the community that you guys have created. So thank you so much. Please keep being wonderful like you are and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Take care and much love.